Uh, to a beautiful city uh, and uh, what we call the, the Great Eight, the Eight Congressional District. We're here uh, today to talk about a really, really important issue on the, the border opening. And, and many of you have uh, have uh, high stakes in uh, the opening of the border. For those of you who I have not met, I am uh, Pete Stauber. I represent the Eighth District. Uh, in Congress, and I'm in my second term. I uh, was uh, first elected in uh, 2018. And this issue is extremely important. I've been working on it for over a year. And uh, today's uh, event is to uh, talk about not only the importance, but like the next steps. How do we and, and what should we? And I want to uh, hear from our panelists as we get going here. But uh, it's a wonderful group of people. And so we want to really be efficient with our time because I know your time is valuable. So what we're going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to introduce or let uh, my colleague Michelle Bushbach introduce herself as a freshman in the 117th Congress. Uh, Michelle represents the 7th District and has uh, the western part uh, of Minnesota and the northern part. So uh, Representative Bishbach. Well, thank you very much and thank you all for being here. I really sincerely appreciate um, the kind of discussion that we are going to have today and I appreciate you taking the time, all of our panelists and everyone here and taking the time to be here because this is such a huge issue. And um, and Congressman Stauber mentioned that he's, he's been working on it uh, for over a year. I've been working on it for 92 days since the day, that day I was sworn in. So I, I'm the new guy. And so I appreciate hearing what is going on and if there are solutions that we can come up with and so that we have a better understanding of truly how it is, what is, how is it affecting everyone? And then we can take that information with us as we look for a solution to it. So I appreciate y'all being here and just, I do represent the seventh district and it goes all the way from the Canadian, it's the Western, literally the Western half of Minnesota, goes all the way from the Canadian border, one county short of the Iowa border. So it is a big, big territory. And, um, and I am happy to be here and looking forward to hearing from everyone on the panel and, uh, and everyone joining us via Zoom. And again, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman. It's great to have uh, one minute introductions and bear with us because we do have. What? Huh? Those are the Canadians. Those are the Canadians. We have one minute in, in introductions, but bear with us as we uh, 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 members of uh, in, in Canada that are going to introduce themselves. Um, and what we're going to ask is, uh, 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 give us your name, where you're from, your information, and, and why you're here. And the member of the parliament will be able to explain that. So uh, bear with us. We're going to uh, have the members of parliament introduce themselves first. And for our Canadian friends, uh, one of you take the lead, and uh, we'll start now. Go ahead. Uh, Dan, you want to go first? Or I, I'm Marcus Pulowski. I'm a member of parliament for Thunder Bay Rainy River, which goes from Thunder Bay to the Manitoba border. Um, I think that's all northern Minnesota. Um, greetings to everybody. Good to be here. Greetings to the congressman, congresswoman, and MP Dan Mazier. I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear what you all have to say about um, reopening the border. Um, let me start by saying, although I, I am a liberal member of parliament, I do not represent the government and I do not speak for the government, um, but I, I can certainly give you my opinions as to what I think should be happening. So certainly I think like you all on the American side, we've heard so many stories about problems arising from the closure of the borders. One of the biggest ones being the impact on the tourism industry in Northwestern Ontario, which is uniquely um, connected to the Midwestern United States. And they get almost all of their tourism from that part uh, of the United States, very little from anywhere else in Canada. So they've really been devastated. But also a, lo a lot of businesses are, are, are run by or owned by someone on one or the other side of the border or have close connections across the border. There's a, a lot of people who have families across the border and people who've had family members who've, who've been sick. Um, people 
who've had to go to the United States for cancer treatment and, and are having difficulties going across the border. So there's there, there there's been really so many problems, and certainly it's been economically pretty devastating having the, the border closed and, and also it's been a, a great disruption to to people on both sides of the border so certainly we want the border open the border will open obviously the question is when I, th I think as far as Canada is concerned um, the health and safety of the Canadian citizens is, is paramount um, but I think there is an answer and the answer in my mind is the vaccinations which really seem to um, be turning things around in the United States and I think quickly in Canada. And, and I, I would note in passing that a recent uh, report from Israel showed that um, Pfizer vaccine decreased um, um, occurrence of asymptomatic COVID by 93%. So I think really the answer is going to be is proof of vaccination because when Canada has, and we're rapidly vaccinating all kind of vulnerable Canadians, a good deal of the population, when we have a lot of people vaccinated, the vulnerable people covered, and when we have Americans showing that they're vaccinated with the vaccine, which really greatly decreases the spread, I think that's when we're going to open the border because the, the, the benefits will certainly outweigh the risk. So with that, thank you. And Dan, I turn it over to you. Thank you. I take it you want uh, introductions and opening remarks at the same time, correct? Like so, two, three minutes. That's we're doing this right. I guess everybody's not, no one's stopping me, so away I go. So yeah, Dan Major, member of Parliament uh, for Dauphin Swan River, Nipawa, Manitoba, uh, which is uh, my writing is basically in the western part of Manitoba. If you were 60 miles north, the riding starts the southern end of it, uh, 60 miles north of the U.S. border, straight north of Minot, North Dakota. So that's where we are. And then we go uh, north for seven hours of driving, basically. So it's a, it's a huge riding. Uh, and it goes, I don't know if you know where Lake Manitoba is to the Saskatchewan border. So it, it is a fairly, fairly big riding. Um, and I'm with the Conservative Party of Canada and the loyal opposition. And I'm here today to discuss this very important uh, issue of uh, border opening um, and, and just how, how we go about it. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion, but yes, good morning and thank you for the invite. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a very important discussion on how we get this border back open. Uh, I know many of, I know basically many of you are very eager to come and visit Manitoba and to watch the Winnipeg Jets beat the Minnesota Wild. I know that's very important, but there are, more important things. <laughs> Wait, there are more important things that connect uh, America and Canada, and that is our economies. I represent thousands of rural Canadians, and just like Minnesota, we enjoy spending our time in the great outdoors. Although we refer to Minnesota as the state of 10,000 lakes, every year thousands of Americans visit Canada to enjoy an abundance of nature. Canada is not only home of world-class fishing and hunting opportunities, but also some of the most dedicated lodge operators and outfitters. Many professional lodges and outfitters in our country rely on American clients for business. Outfitters and guides cannot afford to lose another black bear season, another duck handling season, or another fishing season. Both of our national, provincial, and state parks also attract hundreds of thousands of visitors annually. Too many tourism and hospitality businesses are closing their doors permanently. We must join forces to support them. Our nations truly rely on each other economically. We share a strong economic relationship between our forestry, tourism, and agriculture industries. I believe there needs to be a coordinated plan between our countries to safely and gradually reopen our border. However, it is important to note that America is significantly outperforming Canada in the vaccine rollout. The last time I checked, America had vaccinated nearly 50% of their population whereas Canada has vaccinated less than 16%. I encourage Minnesota to consider asking President Biden to send to Canada a few more vaccines to speed up the reopening of our border. Canada and the United States have the largest trade and travel bilateral relationship in the world. We also proudly share the world's longest undefended border. Canada is a friend and an ally. Let's work together to maintain our relationship and pave the way for a future economic prosperity. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, those comments are, are spot on. And as we, uh, we're gonna introduce, 
for the panelists. Just uh, under one minute. Um, your name, where you're from, organization, and why you're here. And we'll start with my good friend, Greg Dill, to my far right. Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to come and discuss these issues. My name is Greg Dill. I'm a branch manager locally at the Border Bank. What's going on locally at the effect of this border closure, as well as some personal stories, hopefully, of how this has affected some residents of northern Minnesota at the smallest level. My name is Thor Anderson. I'm the airport manager at the National Ball. We also have a fan who's been involved in aviation uh, for 73 years. And I'll bring to the discussion just in terms of numbers of the effects of the, the border closing and, and airline numbers of capacity tanks, et cetera, and the effect of, of uh, uh, lack of capacity in the shopping center facilities. I know the fan of a lot of people here. There are all the laws that we can do. Let's see you all. Bob, that's the shortest I've ever heard you talk. <laughs> Sometimes there's time to hold them, time to hold them, time to walk away, time to walk. I'm Robert Dishai, I'm the chairman of the Grand Porter's Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. I'd like to thank Representative Sauber for inviting me over to this. This is a very important issue for everybody that lives on the border communities, and it's particularly sweet um, interest for us to get to the border. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joe Henry. I'm the director of tourism for Lake New Orleans. And the reason I'm here today is because we have uh, an area that's absolutely magical called the Northwest Station. Northernmost point in the contiguous United States. It's where the 14,550 wildlife in Lake Woods began. And uh, it's, it's home to some of the best fishing and wildlife in the world. And for 13 months, our, uh, our resorts and our business community up there has been cut off from all possible customers. If they were a few miles south, they could market to Americans. If they were just a, a couple of miles to the west, north, or east, they could market to 33 million Canadians. They're in the Northwest Vegas. You can't mark uh, good morning, uh, Mike Roberts and Marvin Williams of Warwick, Minnesota. Can you hear me okay? Make sure the red button's on. Mike. How about now? Yeah? yeah. Talk, talk nice and close. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, my mask on. Just for this. Uh, Mike Roberts from Marvin Windows in Warren, Minnesota. So Warren is to the west, but only six miles from the border. So I guess I'm here to represent not only our business that relies on Canadian workers, but also our community that relies on you know, Canadians sharing back and forth uh, with our community. And they feel more like neighbors, I guess, and, and, and close friends than they do really a border being there. We've got a lot of population right across the border, and they're cut off from us and vice versa. So. Uh, thanks for the opportunity today to talk. See you. My name is Paul Colton. I'm the owner operator of a fourth generation resort on the Northwest Angle. I was originally going to talk about well, this past summer. My uh, sales tax numbers for May, June, and July combined were less than $3. But I'm going to just briefly talk about my experience this morning. What I call 800 camp pass. That's the uh, number we have to call in order to get a clearance number so we can transit Manitoba and go anywhere in the United States. I was in, uh, informed by the officer there that what their process is they call the local office, which would be Laurel in this case, because I was from this direction. I told them I was going to get groceries for the essential of life. That officer at War Room, that technically that's Craig, informed the Hamilton Call Center, which informed me that if I cross the border to go down to War Room, I would need to present a negative P4 test in order for me to return home tonight. So as I sit here, I'm thinking that they've blown up my business and they just took my home this morning. So, or a representative of the MP from, from the 
Dan, I think, I can't remember his last name, from uh, Fox, my in laws are from Dauphin. My wife is Canadian, my kids are both citizens, my dog's Canadian. So I've got all the cross border things that's going on. But the Northwest Angle, but it can't get worse. I can't get home tonight. There's no ice to use, there's no water to use because we're in Delta. That's where I'm at right now. Well, I can't uh, top that, that's for sure. Uh, I'm Dan Fabian. and I'm the duly elected mayor of the city of Rozo. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation to everyone. One of the things that's an issue in Rozo is healthcare. And there's a great working relationship between uh, Canadians at, at Manitoba and the Life Care Medical Center in Rozo, where the Canadians uh, can come down for healthcare. But that's not working out so well uh, now because of the situation of board so we can get a little bit in depth on that as well today. I think that there's a whole host of issues uh, with regard to uh, what's going on in terms of tourism, commerce, and all that stuff. We just need to get the board back over up with us today. I'll be happy to be a part of this process. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Trisha Heidel, and I'm the president of the International Voluntary Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Representative Sauber and Representative Fishback, for hosting this today. I think, as expressed along the panel, this is just a vital conversation right now, and we appreciate you starting this for both sides of the border. Um, you know, as representatives on the panel already this morning, this has obviously had major impact on all border communities as we're very integrated with each other. So, in addition to the commerce, it's recreation, it's family, it's socializing. It's landowners, it's tourists, all of this talk. So I look forward to the dialogue today and the progress that can come from. Hello, my name is uh, Rick Rohn. I'm the mayor of Quadat. Um, I have been the mayor for quite a while, dealt uh, with a lot of activity with our um, sister community across the border. Um, we need to get the border back, open back up. Um, we have a lot of families that have uh, kids over there. Um, we have uh, our school uh, has a joint hockey program. Um, the kids were not allowed to come over and because they joined a hockey system in the U.S. because they didn't have a program over there. They weren't allowed to get into any kind of Canadian hockey program, which is terrible for these children. And we need to get the border. You know, we need to do it safely. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking about uh, some of the commerce. Uh, got some numbers from some of our businesses that have. That's going to work. Is that louder? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can yell too, but I don't want to. Um, but I'm happy that we, you know, these people, our representatives, our Canadian partners that are on the Zoom or the web thing, have uh, put this meeting together because it is important. Um, people don't, you know, at higher levels make decisions that uh, affect us on the border. And uh, you know, my mom hasn't seen her granddaughter in over a year, you know, so. There's a lot of families like that. We need to figure out how to get those come back up. Thank you uh, for putting this together. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks, uh, the panelists, for spending some time with us today. I think it's really important. You know, um, I'm sure many of you have stories uh, that uh, were we'll shared here uh, just in the introduction. I can't imagine uh, not being able to see a family member, a loved one, uh, or not being with a family member. Uh, you know, maybe when they're passing, that human touch. And it's just, it's its not only Minnesota, it's the entire border from upstate New York all the way to Washington. This is happening. And you'll see our good our good Canadian friend, many of the, the bigger cities are on the border. And, uh, and we wanna be able to have a conversation today and make sure that uh, this administration understands the importance. You know, we, we go, uh, the Trump administration, I sent to not only the administration and the Secretary of State then, but I've sent letters to the, the Biden administration and the Secretary of State on, on let's have these discussions. It's urgent now. I was up here over a year ago or about a year ago, and some of our seasonal businesses, this is this now we're entering our second year of not having the opportunity to bring that commerce or the economy. Uh, uh, to the respective communities. And we know that the it, 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 
it's, it's mutually beneficial when we open the border. And as uh, one of the members of parliament talked about, uh, the more vaccines, only 60%. Uh, we have to be very, very, I think, uh, happy where we're at as a nation, getting the vaccines out, Operation Warp Speed, up. Operation Warp Speed work. Now we need uh, people that uh, that want the vaccine to get the vaccine. We need the, the seniors and our most vulnerable to be able to have that and get the vaccine and um, and uh, start opening up your economy. Right now we're seeing the right now we're seeing the the uh, you know the the major problems uh, hitting our communities and. And I think that it's important for us to recognize there's if there's a will, there's a way. If we have an administration and we have a Prime Minister Trudeau who want to work on this issue and make sure that, for instance, those uh, Americans that own uh, cabins in Canada that can get there by boat and not even seeing another person for 20 miles, that they can do that. And I think the uh, members of parliament uh, would agree we want it. We want fair and equitable. We want to be able to have uh, open in a safe, responsible way because our communities, our economy, we talk about small businesses that are the economic engines. They're the economic engines, especially on our border communities. You know, we've got schools and we've got uh, sporting events and we've got uh, family and relatives that, that need that literally that human touch. And as we, uh, and I, I really believe we're, with COVID now, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel with what's happening, um, you know, with the vaccination and and uh, the, the the skill of our uh, our doctors and our health uh, our, our health uh, employees. I will say to uh, Marcus and Dan, I want to really thank you for being here because the conversations that we had nine and ten months ago, they're here now. We have to really push. You have to push Premier Trudeau. And we have to push uh, President Biden and his administration to understand the magnitude of this. We can't wait any longer. We can't, as you say, miss another fishing season, another uh, uh, bear hunting or what have you. Look at Lake of the Woods. Look at the opportunities that we're missing out. We can do it. And I think that we have the, I think we have the formula. Um, so I would just, a couple of questions for the panelists here. And uh, you can just jump in and ask. We're not going to. Uh, we're not. We want to be make this as informal as possible. But do keep your remarks to a minute or so. A couple of questions. Uh, you know, since the U.S. Uh, Canadian border has been closed just over a year ago, what have the impacts been to you and your community? And then, as we discuss solutions to our government's approach to the pandemic, what outlined questions or challenges remain that hinder? our ability to reopen the border, then how can we impress upon our leaders the importance of providing certainty to our communities as we seek to reopen the border? These are just a couple of questions that, uh, that Congresswoman Fishback and I want to hear. We want to hear the dialogue, and then we want to bring it back to the interparliamentary group, which uh, I am a part of, and we are a part of. It's uh, many members of Congress and uh, uh, members of Parliament are part of that. They're having these discussions uh, in other places across the country, so we uh, can bring these questions to the Secretary of State and the Biden administration in hopes that we get some get some type of uh, uh, immediate and quick response as we enter another season. So with that, those are some of the questions that uh, that we have. If there's some other ones or comments you want to make, uh, let's go. Um, uh, I'm just going to start with you, Bob. Uh, or, uh, uh, for about the airport, you had mentioned some devastating statistics to, for the Falls uh, Anderson Airport. Can you mention them, please? Certainly, Pete. Uh, once again, I very much appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the efforts made by our, our community partners, it, it's uh, uh, greatly appreciated that, that uh, we're here today. Just a real quick stance on the impact of, of the border collision at the Falls Airport. In 2019, 16,987 people uh, in, in, in planes on February 31st at the airport. In 2020, that number is went to 5,409, or we said the final. 
to the third sixty six point six percent reduction in uh, in, in pension year load. The interesting uh, sub respect uh, to that uh, stat that is uh, about forty five percent of those passengers are Canadians. Um, also, in, under that umbrella of those numbers, uh, we have uh, uh, charters, large large charters that are provided by Sun Country Airlines in Minneapolis. And what it is, it's a charter slash a casino, we call it casino junk. It's a one stop shopping. And uh, that's very, very popular among our Canadian friends. Uh, and those aircraft, those usually are made up between 45 and 50 percent Canadian. Uh, and enjoy the uh, and enjoy the, the, the casino junk that's in the air. Um, to to put it into a perspective, uh, as Pete was asking about uh, impact of, of, of our of our business, uh, just a real quick history. Not to make it about my family, but uh, sitting to my right, my nephew Greg Dill. And between our families, uh, we've been involved in family aviation for decades. And uh, with that, uh, with the border crossing, we've seen we've seen a ninety percent reduction. Uh, in our business in the last uh, 13 months, um, we're basically the opposite of fail. Uh, winter time, uh, there's full activity. Summertime, 90% of our revenue is 90 days in the summer. That is, uh, and in that, in that subject, if that would go to that, is Canadian migration, Canadian fishing, uh, people going to farm and lodges or private properties, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that has been, uh, shall we say, challenging uh, to, to say the least. A little history on U.S. Customs and Canadian Customs International Fall in Port Francis. Very interesting. Um, uh, my father and his brother started the airport in 1948 and in 1950. Uh, at that point, U.S. Customs, both U.S. Customs and Canadian Customs were offered at the International Fall Airport. And when they completed the Port Francis Airport in 1970, at that point, that's when uh, Canadian Customs was offered at, at Port Francis, Ontario. Uh, a little sidebar story to that. Uh, my dad offered his uh, consulting and uh, expertise of helping design the airport facility, and his fee was that he was the first person to get cleared at that airport. Um, so just some history uh, on that. It's uh, uh, also with the with the lockdown, it's, it's very interesting. Um, international flights, uh, we, we, we service and cater international flights and talk from across the pond. And so I uh, made a lease on the clients were happy. And uh, through these, uh, through, through, through the lockdown, we just spent uh, a very reduced time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Fabian and Rose over the top prior to. Uh, tell us about uh, the, the, the issues with Rose you had mentioned, not only how, but the workforce. We can't get the, the workers. Yeah, so, and I mentioned earlier the uh, healthcare issue. One of the things that the CEO of the Lifeway Medical Center uh, said to me was just with regards to the workforce, they used to have four Canadian employees at the uh, healthcare facility in Roseville. Now they're down to one. And some of that has to do with the ability to get back and forth across the border. And in that light, I want to mention also that. The 24 hour ports along the border are open, you know, for certain things. But when you go to uh, Roseau and Piney and Lancaster, the port hours have been reduced greatly. And that started actually a few years ago. One of the issues that we no. think is really super important in and around Roseau and Lancaster and Greenbush and places like that is more. Uh, border crossing hours or more open hours at the border. So at Rosa, Rosa, Rosa the border now is only open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock in the evening. If people were fortunate enough to be able to go to the Northwest Angle, uh, if you were getting, you have to time your uh, uh, arrival and departure at the border so that that would coincide. And then just one other thing with regards to the angle, I really admire the ingenuity of people out there and the hard work and the creativeness that people like Mr. Colson and stuff. I mean, they've, they've, they've plowed an ice road this winter to try to get some traffic up there. It's amazing what they're willing to try to do to keep their businesses afloat. One of the things that I proposed early on when all this started happening is that if you have property or you have a reservation at a resort, when you get to the border and you want to move to the Northwest Angle, sign an affidavit that says we swear under penalty of whatever that we're not going to get out of our vehicle. We're just going to drive through the manageable portion of that to get back to the U.S. side. 
And I think that if we had some common sense there, we could implement some of that stuff and it would help. With regards to commerce, there's a lot of things that go on because of the border closure times don't allow for effective transportation of safe scrap metal from the facility in the Greenbush area because they get it up to Winnipeg and then get their trucks back. So, you know, we have to address that issue as well. Um, those are the things that are the most important to us and we can talk more about the healthcare stuff then with regard to the point. I, I think from your experience on St. Paul, the legislation, you don't legislate for the exception. Uh, and, and that's what you're talking about on the crossing uh, an affidavit to go directly to your camp or directly to your cabin. I think that uh, we have to we have to recognize that administration has to recognize that as well. Well put. Uh, before we uh, go any further, I do want to introduce uh, uh, Devon Weber. He's from Let Us Unite. He's on with us virtually, and this is about. Uh, Devin is talks about the impacts to families, about the family impact uh, that he's uh, working with um, uh, across the country, and the impacts that families are having, and, and the trouble uh, that they have with not seeing their loved one, their relative, or what have you, uh, on uh, the other side of the border. I think that's important. Um, and also, Mike Boomer. Uh, Mike uh, is from Ryan's Border Store, uh, just. Uh, uh, by the uh, South of Grand, uh, the, uh, Pigeon River Crossing there. Um, it's been there for a while. And again, that is uh, his, his, his commerce comes from the travel uh, across the border and it's been devastating. So uh, Devon and, and Mike, thank you for uh, joining us uh, today. We are talking about issues that, that you're working on already. And Mike, you and I have talked, of, our staff has talked about the importance of, of you know, opening the borders as well. I, I want to uh, really, um, there's one question that I have to uh, ask a Chairman DeChamp, and, and you and I have talked on the importance of, of, the, of your facility, uh, the gaming facility, with the number of, of uh, you know, uh, Canadian friends that come down and, uh, and uh, be entertained by you and, and the tribe. Okay. Yeah, Grand Port is bad. We own, we own and operate a casino, lobby, and hotel. The, um, the revenue from that supports the community of Grand Port, it supports the education, water and sewer um, programs, our community center, our elderly, everything comes out of that casino to support our community. We have approximately 500 people that live um, within the reservation. And um, I guess one of the positive things, we've had one COVID case in a year and that actually got transmitted from the host and the person brought it back to Grand Portage. Um, we have 80% of our residents are vaccinated now. Everybody who wants to get vaccinated is vaccinated. And Cook County as a whole has 60 plus percent vaccinated. So we are doing the right thing on the North Shore. It's, um, it's about, I guess I go back to some of the things I wandered off with. About 80 to 90 percent of our customers come from Thunder Bay, so we do rely on them. Um, we we're trying everything we can marketing down south, and we just can't get people to come up. You know, the state parks are full capacity. We have the state park right at Pigeon River that is full capacity, and you know they'll swing through our national monument, but we can't get them to stick around. So. It's very important to us that we get the border open. And going back to the other gentleman there, we have employees that work for us. They work for our um, environmental department. Um, he, his kids live in Thunder Bay. He hasn't seen his kids for over a year. Just in FaceTime and whatnot. They're his teenage kids. And he just can't go see them. And we have employees that are um, tribal members that day treaty to go back and forth to come down and work for us. But the importance of the border opening for ground portage is, is unbelievable. You know, we have one road in, one road out. Yeah. So right at the tip of the arrowhead. I just yeah, you know, it's enough to have bringing this together so we can at least be talking about it. At least we'll hear something about it. I assure you, Mr. Chairman, we're working on it. We we will continue to work on it. Um, uh, 
I'm going to, in this order, I'm going to go to uh, uh, Tricia from um, the uh, International Falls Chamber of Commerce, and then I'm going to go to uh, uh, Senator Lasari. But before I do that, I do want to, um, I do want to say that uh, I, I want Dan or Marcus, uh, our friends uh, from Parliament, to talk about, give us one minute on what your country is doing uh, to get more vaccines. You say only 16%. What, what percentage is needed for your country, for Premier Trudeau, to say, yeah, let's talk about opening the border? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, the prime minister has repeatedly said that by the end of September, all Canadians who'd want um, to have a vaccine would be vaccinated. Now there's talk, I think, of of all Canadians who want a vaccine maybe having their first shot, because here it's a little different than the states in that um, I I think our public health people have decided that perhaps it's better, quicker to give everybody one dose of vaccine and then prolong the interval between the two doses as that would allow us to cover more people um, quicker. I, now, I think that September deadline is, is very, very conservative. Um, that's based purely on Pfizer and Moderna. It doesn't include Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, um, Novavax, and we've got millions and millions of doses of those um, ordered as well, and most of them coming in the second quarter, meaning from from March on. So I think that the numbers will rapidly go up. I think our government is, in in my estimation, being a little overly conservative in how fast we think we can vaccinate people. Um, but I, I I'm thinking, and this is my personal opinion, I'm thinking by June or July we're going to have a considerable portion of our population vaccinated. That in my thinking. Again, this this is just me. That that when Americans can show proof of vaccination, and we have a, a good deal of our population and, and all the vulnerable ones vaccinated, that then I think we're probably going to be in a, a pretty good position. But that's and now um, Dan and, and being in the opposition may have other things to say about how we're doing in vac in vaccinating people. But Dan, I, I turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Marcus. And I, you, you did state it very well, like as far as where the reality is where we are in Canada. I think, and the problem with this all is not having a clear path. Like business hates uncertainty. And this is what it's, it's, it's driving us into the ground on, on these different decisions. So we have another wave. We have another set of lockdowns. That just takes much more, uh, it just knocks businesses right out to the side. And individuals, this is what I can't get over. We talked about the outfitters and those those people in rural U.S. or U, uh, rural Canada. They're the ones that are getting hammered. The ones, the big businesses, the Walmarts and all these, they've let their supply chains are fine. Even agriculture, you know, we've been pretty fortunate to have uh, our, our supply chains and our parts and we can grow the product and we can get the product out of the country. But it's it's these individuals, these these, these uh, and and the the professionals that we can't get back for. We have a forestry industry in this uh, in the riding here in, in Canada. Of course, uh, we need those professionals to come up from the United States. LP is the is the company. It's a U.S. company. They want to do a turnaround. They needed professionals to come up from there. We can't get them across. So industry even starts those those industries that are thriving. They can't get lumber for two by four for the life of God. And then meanwhile, we're, uh, we can't get the people to actually fix the equipment. So that, that that's in itself is uh, posing a bigger problem. So, you know, once we get the vaccines, get it, uh, but we need a plan. We need a definite plan and we need to be both on the same page. That I can't emphasize enough. We need to be both talking as neighbors, how are we going to overcome this? And uh, I think that's going to be the key uh, in, in the coming months. And I, this is Michelle Fishback. I, I don't know if you can, I don't think, I don't know if you guys can see me, but um, but I just kind of had a, a follow up uh, for the members of parliament. Maybe maybe just give us an idea of what, if there is anything, or what are the thoughts on opening that border? You talked about the vaccine, and do you believe that they would wait until that point where you have you know a certain percentage, or do you think there are other um, other opportunities to even? Even if it's just to the annual inlet, but um, just wondering if uh, what your thoughts are, what you're hearing, what the um, ideas from Canada about getting forward. 
Oh, I, I know we've been asking for rapid testing, like the tools that are available to us. We've had pilot programs all across uh, in Calgary. Uh, a rapid testing program, a sound scientifically based rapid testing testing program, uh, would would go a long way. Giving giving businesses and giving uh, you know even airports that we're talking about that uh, having very a focused plan of how we're going to start coming across the border, where you're going to go, uh, just having that would be uh, so much, would, would create certainty and people would start feeling the comfort that they could start having be part of the solution instead of looking at government and saying, well, until we have the, the vaccine. So, you know, we're, the conversation's very much in a flux right now and it's, it, it changes daily. Like we don't know when the vaccines are coming and that, that is, that is our Achilles heel, but uh, I don't know, Marcus, if you want to add anything else to that. Well, one of the things with the vaccines is, and we're told by the head of Pfizer Canada that um, worldwide vaccines have, are ordered by the quarter. Um, so we know how many vaccine doses are coming in by what um, April, May, by the end of June. But when within that period, we're, we're, we're not as certain, but all, all countries have, have, have done the same thing. Um, I, I, I know there is this desire for, for certainty to have an answer um, as to when we're going to open things. But I, I think the reality is with, with COVID that the, the science is changing all the time. So, for example, there was this concern that people, although vaccinated, could still get an infection and spread the disease. Now, um, the recent evidence, and this has just come out, the best study from Israel just in the last week is suggesting, no, that that's quite rare that you you can have an asymptomatic infection once you've been vaccinated. So so that's why, and I think in the next couple of months, there's going to be clarity. And I, I understand in the business desire to, to um, to have that clarity and they need it for their businesses. But un unfortunately, um, we're, we're on the cutting edge of science. And as, as the new information comes in, we process it and we incorporate it into our policies. As to the, um, the, the testing, and I think specifically the rapid testing and, and being a long time doctor, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with this, is, is the problem is that people want to use the rapid test uh, for its negative predictive value, meaning you've got a negative test and you don't have COVID. Um, but with the rapid test kits, it, it, it's not very good for that because you can be early on in an infection. You could have just been exposed to the virus six hours earlier and you just, it's going to be a negative test, but you go on to have um, COVID. So I, I personally, and this is my personal opinion, I don't think the rapid tests are the way to go, but I think the vaccines are. And I think that they, they work. And, 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 and I, there is also uncertainty because of the variants, but certainly the vaccine works on the British variant. It seems like it'll probably work on the South African Brazilian variant, but that too produces some uncertainty. But I do think that there is there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that light will become apparent in the next couple months that we will get that clarity and be able to tell people. And, 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 and I think you're already seeing it in the States. I mean, I watched yesterday the uh, March Madness, the, the final, and there were fans there and the Blue Jays against the um, Texas Rangers, full stadium, I, I think maybe a little unwise, but um, you're already seeing in the States things starting to open up. And, and I think people's mentality will change in the next few months and, and that our conversation is going to start to change. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be too pessimistic about the opening. I think it will, it will come in, in, in the not too distant future, but unfortunately we can't say when. That's my opinion. Thank you for your comments, uh, Marcus. Uh, now I'm gonna to go to uh, Tricia, the uh, I Falls uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, President. Thank you. So in regards to local impact, I think is what we're gonna reference in a while, but the border closure has really just doubled the COVID impact on our community in the past year. And even as Minnesota has said, releasing and relaxing some of the restrictions and allowing businesses to open, States on industry, roughly 30 to 60 percent in some instances of our consumer base is still in Canada. So those businesses just don't have the customers available to help make up those profit differentials that they've lost over the past year. 
Um, I understand that at both sides of the border, we also share that concern of rural medicine and those impacts of how that moves through our community. But I really was impressed with the internet, well, all of the northern Puget County last summer. You know, we saw an incredible increase in tourism on the like Voyager National Park. Camping numbers were near record breaking, household needs of resort. You know, people who couldn't get into Canada found their way here and, and had a great vacation. And we did not see really spikes or have a lot of negative impact. And I think that the regulations for businesses and their commitment to following those to protect them both their employees as well as their visitors really did what they needed to do and kept everybody uh, safe and having a good vacation for the summer. So we would love to see our Canadian partners be able to share and implement some of those as well and allow some of those tourist package the calls that we would get in our office, you know, for people not only in southern Minnesota, but around the United States, where you just often hear, you know, inquiring about border openings, you know, are, are just generations of travel activity and tradition that they are really missing out on and would like to be able to continue to share and maintain. So we hope that even the phasing, we understand that the border, just like other COVID restrictions, have kind of been phased, that maybe border openings can be phasing as well, that there's additional considerations for the families, for the other, and, you know, even though I represent businesses at the chamber, we always have sensitivity on that dialogue of businesses versus people. It really is not one or the other. It's how we support everybody through this together. Uh, very well said. And you, you mentioned, um, you know, families. It's so important that we, that we have to, that, that people understand in other parts of this country that border communities we have friends, relatives on both sides uh, and, and crossing daily, not only to work, but to see uh, our, our friends and relatives. Um, before we go to Senator Lassard, I want to go to Mike Boomer. Um, the, uh, uh, he's the owner of uh, uh, Ryden's Border Store on Pigeon River. Mike, if, you, uh, if you're all set to go, why don't you give us uh, uh, some indication of, of how this, uh, the crossing has, uh, the, 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 uh, has affected your business? Well, thank you, uh, Congressman. We're, uh, we're glad to be able to join this meeting. We're glad this meeting has taken place. Um, it's needed. Uh, it's the time is right. Um, we, we, uh, our business, our general business is down over 90%. The gas station is closed. The duty-free store is closed. Um, you know, we, and like uh, Bobby said with the casino and the reservation, we need Canadian travel. We need it. We need the commerce back and forth. We are, are we've been in business for 75 years. We're third generation. Third generation has its own challenges, um, let alone two governments working against us. And uh, I had a manager of 10 years leave the community to find work. Um, we're finding other people looking elsewhere, leaving the community to find work. Um, if when this opens, it's going to be busy. We're going to need workers. And again, as, as Bob from the reservation can attest, finding workers in rural areas is not easy either. And we've had, we have, our workers are our family. And we do the best we can to, to keep them and to um, have healthy community at, at the Canadian, at the Canadian border. And um, this, we need some sort of opening, not, tomorrow i mean we need it now we need something to start moving i can't i can't emphasize that enough i don't these communities need some travel we need we need commerce back and forth now so thank you for this, so thank you for this meeting thanks for the comments Mike. and i i get the opportunity to uh, just uh Senator Lazard, and we did serve together in the Senate, and I'm very happy to see you today. But, um, it, you know, Senator Lazard, if you could just give us your thoughts on how the border closures are Just a word. <laughs> it was almost like an ad. I, I talk every day, almost every other day, the fire service is for French, you know, and uh, Vic and Andrew, and I uh, talked to them yesterday. And, the big issue is they don't know what to do. You know, you got your reservation, June. Well, they got to go some other place. And 
Treasury will buy a almost a two million dollar airplane that I pay for. And, uh, so I think the big issue is I said I speak for the authority, I talk about Vesta Falls, uh, Kenora, the Blouse in the water. And the big issue is to give us a date, you know, in June. Well, it's not going to be June. Some of those people will move to July. I talked to some friends of mine yesterday on the way up here uh, out of the Michigan Walker. Uh, not trying to be funny, they're good friends, but they kind of like it. But not really. They got a great year because of our customers going over there. And uh, but they uh, they're with us on opening the period. I talked to Mr. Falls yesterday. Some friends of mine had a store at Sun Arrows and Sula Falls. Three people yesterday. I told them I was going to be here to go on the group. I said, the only thing you want to put across is uh, give us a date. Just give us a date. If June's wiped out, we can move some of those people to to July. And I don't know how, how I can express that enough. And by the way, I'll, you know, I represented this district all those years. So, and both my kids are Canadian. So you got to know that I, what you were talking about, uh, it's uh, close to me too. So that's all, all I got to say. But I do talk to people every day I'm on the phone. And I told him I was coming here, please, the bill and that the message they wanted to have, and this is from Canadians. And they are if give us if they can just give us some type of a date, then we can ship some of these people. So that's about it. Thanks for please putting this on. Appreciate it. By the way, hi you guys. <laughs> people that know me all the years. Thank you very much. And um, you know, I'd like to just go to Mr. Henry and Mr. Colson. Um but can you give us, can you explain, you know, tourism has had to be a horrible year. And, um, and so it's very devastating. So can you maybe just give us some of those experiences? And then um, in addition to that, maybe what it would take for a couple, what, what at least, you know, Senator Clark talked a little bit about getting dates, but are, are we going to be able to recover? You know, tourism brings so much to the area, you know, not only to those, uh, those businesses directly serving, but all of the commercial businesses. Um, so, uh, Mr. Henry, I'll go to you first, and then we'll go to Mr. Colson. Great, sure. Well, thank you, Tom. So, right now we have, uh, you know, Lake of the Woods, uh, uh, the Northwest Bay. Uh, it takes 40 miles drive, 40 mile drive through Canada, through Manitoba, in order to reach the United States again. And that's the issue, traveling through Canada. Now, right now we have resorts that are down 90%. And they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to get under the longer. It's been 13 months. Not only are they down 90 percent so far, they haven't gotten one more penny of any kind of financial aid than any other any other business on Main Street, Minnesota, where Americans can reach them. So it's it's been pretty frustrating. Uh, not only that, every every month that goes by, their customers, which they've built up over decades. Those customers are going to other places in Minnesota and other parts of the Midwest, naturally, because they still want to go on vacation. And they go to these places and they like them because they're nice and they, they're not as far as the drive. And there's not as many hassles going. So consequently, every month that goes by, they're also losing market share. So now when, when we do open up, they're gonna have to build that up. It's not like they're starting from point, you know, square one. So it's tough. Two things I would say. Number one, it's 40 miles through Manitoba. You know what? Should we make that an international travel corridor? It would be easy to do so. You know what? Should we should we have a, an affidavit? Should we have a GPS system? Should we have a check-in system? There's people that are traveling back to their home state of Alaska and they have to check in and get there at a certain amount of time. Big, big penalties if you have to deviate. You know, back 40 years ago, uh, commercial anglers, that, that they couldn't bring their fish through Manitoba to get down to the, to the US. What they did is they set up a pilot car. They paid the Canadians an opportunity, a pilot car that would lead uh, their car crew there and back. Should we pay for a pilot car that would lead a group twice a day? There's plenty of options. That 40 mile stretch is very desolate. And uh, I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not a physician. But so far, I don't think COVID has spread through a car windshield. Okay. Now, secondly, financial assistance. You know, uh, th these folks need something or they're not gonna be gone for long. It's been 13 months. It's hard enough to run a business as an entrepreneur in good times, let alone putting this stress on. With that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Mr. Colson. Okay. 
Well, and, and Mr. Henry, I will just kind of add right in here because you talk about the financial assistance. And one of the things that we've been talking about, and you can just give me your input, is we've been talking about potentially doing some forgivable, forgivable loans, particularly in the annual inlet area, but you know, that have lost uh, income or assets. So if that's something, uh, love your input on that, if you had any you know, ideas and thoughts, but that was one of the things that we're taking around right now. But we appreciate, you know, a forgivable loan program would be great because you know what it would do? It would help these businesses to, to hang on. And it's not make up everything to blast, it's just to hang on. You know, uh, the Northwest Eagle Guest Ice Field, I'm sure many of you have seen PR from that in this winter. You know, that, that Northwest Eagle Guest Ice Field saved many of the resorts up at the Northwest Eagle. And that was a venture from Northwest Eagle resorters who already, their backs are against the wall, uh, both emotionally and financially. And they had to put in seed capital money. You know that road cost over $130,000? But thank goodness the fees recovered from vehicles used in the guest ice uh, for broke that even so that people could get up to the angle. Now, people didn't make all like a normal winter. They still were at 40 or 50 or 60% of a normal winter season. But I'll tell you what, it gave them two things. It gave them a little bit of money to hang on. It gave them something else that's huge. That's cool. But that, that was strictly... From, from the residents of the Northwest Eagle created that on their own. Thank, thank God they did. And we appreciate your support. Thank you. Mr. Colson. So I don't really want to double up on what Joe said. Um, or just give me a moment here. The, uh, I don't know how many letters have been written across border from our federal politicians from the state. Pretty sure that I know how many have been responded to, and I would say that's probably zero. It's there's a lack of want. It would be so easy for, for, for us to have a travel corridor. I'm not looking for the Canadian border to be blown wide open. I'm looking for us to be able to go back and forth from America to America. Like I said. As of this morning, I was told by Canada Customs that I have to have a way to be court next to get home. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Um, I guess we might see it all on the move. So I'm currently having my property tax hasn't been reevaluated. I'm assuming that my resort is going to want nothing. I'm still paying what it was assessed at. Um, my insurance, I still have to be current on that because every 30 days we're hopefully hoping that we will we'll have our businesses open. So we have to stay current. All, the, all my expenses are, are there because, like, like um, Mr. Lazar was saying, we, we just don't know, we don't know what to plan for. So I can tell you, we need, we need to go forward with something. The Northwest Angle would be a very simple test. As far as opening this border up, like I said, I'm not looking for an open border. I'm looking for a travel corridor. I also like people to look at the border water treaties in 1909. And the first appendix there talks about the right of navigation on international waters, also the right of commerce. As far as I know, COVID doesn't trust international treaties, but apparently they seem to have in this case. So it just seems like there's a lack of will to get this travel corridor established, not a lack of not knowing that we exist. We are only have a hundred boats in my tiny community, and that is my problem. If we had Minneapolis at the angle, we wouldn't have this problem. We don't get anybody elected on the Canadian side, there's no good bump side for that. We don't get anybody elected on the American side. This should actually be a feel good story where cross border politicians can actually meet and come up with a super simple solution. We've quoted hundreds of them, not an exaggeration, but I can tell you a dozen. But there's a lack of a want on the Canadian side to even engage. There's not even a seat at the table. This is the first forum we've had 13 months in. It's it's frustrating beyond all things I can describe. Um, it's hard for me to keep my emotions in check. I can talk about how my wife hasn't, hasn't seen her, her parents, they're 85, 82 years old, 18 months. Um, 
They're vaccinated now. They live in Gotham and go back to that later. But the solution is so simple for our community. And there are other expat communities. There's Port Lagos, Capital Island, and Hyde, Alaska. These are four expat communities that could be. It's easy to come up with solutions, to come up with solutions, but I need the political will to do it. Pete, can I can I respond to that? Um, I it, it it sounds like in Northwest Angle has to go through Manitoba, which is not my riding, but it's close enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've certainly heard a lot about from the Canadian side, but I I'm not familiar of the problems faced by Northwest Angle. I certainly sympathize, and I will ask our government um, both. Um, global affairs and border services to look into um, the situation faced by people in your community and um, through my office. And I don't know, Pete, is that is that your writing? But but we can get back to you in terms of um, what our government can do. No, Marcus, uh, uh, myself and Congressman Fishback, it's her area. Uh, and she will be a point of contact for that. But we really appreciate uh, that suggestion. And I, I just will say, that we the, the the official forums who are right, but I've been working on this issue since the middle of last summer. Um, you know, begging uh, the uh, Kevin McCarthy to put me on the interparliamentary group so I could talk to people, not just from uh, you know Ontario, Manitoba, but uh, we're looking at Quebec and, and uh, uh, Saskatchewan and and British Columbia. Those are I, I've been talking to those those. Uh, uh, Members and, and, and I want to just assure you, I, I'm I can feel I can see the pain and it bothers me and I know Congresswoman Fishback can too and I think it's important that when we go back we talk about these things and just to have just a blanket policy to have a blanket policy on our uh, on our respective communities on both sides of the border is and I believe is unfair. Uh, for those of you who have, for those people that haven't lived in those communities for years and, and been part of the economy on both sides. And I think that just a blanket policy, some good suggestions on, on opportunities for us. But uh, as, as uh, I said to Mayor Fabian, you know, we can't legislate for that exception, that one person that may. We have to do this. The vast majority of people are law abiding and they want to do what's right. And uh, so I, I really appreciate uh, your comments. And uh, Mayor, you wanted to say something? You had a couple of speakers. I would just like to say that what do you think my chances are that I get home tonight? The question was, what do I think the chances of uh, that he gets home tonight? Um, I, I'd like to think 100%, uh, but uh, sometimes the unwillingness of the common sense isn't always there. So what and should I do tonight? Let's see how that plays out. And, and uh, Congresswoman Fishbach and I, before we leave, you will have our direct numbers, and I want to know what happens. And we will uh, stay, stay in touch with us. We need to, and, and I would, I would ask. You know, I, I think it was Marcus who was just mentioning earlier. Uh, about just reaching out and I'd like to make sure that we stay in touch with Marcus uh, so that we have that kind of uh, both sides of the border and if there's anything I don't I don't want to put uh, Marcus on the spot but if there's anything that he could do to help uh, I would hope that he would jump in here too and we will do what we can um, and uh, but there I appear at a, a spot where that's the unknown Mayor Fabian, you had something. You well, put the microphone you. up, Slash. Yeah. So I'm going to interject here a bit. Um, first of all, we have a place to stay at home in Rosa. Okay. If that helps, we have plans to get You know, it's these types of situations that, you know, and you mentioned that there's a lack of will. Uh, I think because of the, uh, the remoteness of the area and the lack of population and so forth, what's troubling to me is that there's not necessarily a lack of will. There's a lack of care. And that's really frustrating. I spent 10 years in the Minnesota legislature. And these types of situations 
that cause people to become skeptical and cynical about governments and bureaucrats and how things work and why things don't work. And Congressman Stavro used the term common sense. When I was in the legislature, I used to refer frequently in committees to Northwest Minnesota common sense or Northern Minnesota common sense, because we do things differently. We find solutions, we solve problems, and we bring those solutions and those problems, uh, the solutions to those problems forward. And we see it as a common sense solution. And in this case here, some sort of a travel corridor or something to help these people out up there. And you cannot get government to even respond to a letter. That's embarrassing. It really is, and it's very, very troubling. So I hope that we can get this to work out. This should be something that Northern Minnesota, working with Southern Manitoba Zip, can get figured out. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Mayor Fabian, and we are working very hard uh, to see what we can do to make this work for everybody. Um, we do have a couple more speakers, and I just wanted to ask, and Mr. Roberts, I thought you thought maybe you were going to get away with that free. Um, but I, I, I'm just wondering if you could give us some ideas on how it really affected, you know, uh, our windows. I mean, it's a huge, huge employer, not only workforce, but, uh, you know, the economic driver. Uh, you know, if you could give us uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have 20 dual citizens that work at the plant in various jobs, and they've been able to go back and forth with essential workers, but not without worrying about what happens tomorrow. Uh, we also have a fall H2B uh, program that uh, helps workers from Canada come over to the United States and work temporarily in the fall. We usually have 25 to 50 folks and that's important for them obviously they want to earn money we need them we need the help of the plant uh, last year we had eight and those were the brave ones i think it, just the, the border issues and the fears and the rumors kept everybody away and they just chose not to be a part of our our company and that's a huge part of our business and then i'll just also add that all these communities along the border have half of their normal radius of workers and shoppers off because of the border, right? So that's the major impact of what that international fall of the border, those old Lancaster, and all the other communities along that border is half of the people, family, friends, you know, literally community members cannot come across the border to do the things that they normally do. And there's family situations, you know, weddings where grandpa and grandma can't come to the wedding. It's literally 20 miles from their home because it's across the border. Just you know, heartbreaking situations like that. So, um, yeah, it, it's a major impact. We're looking for the solution to, and certainly it's been a long time coming and ready for them to start. Thank you very much. Did you did you shut down during the pandemic at all? We did not. Okay, we didn't. Okay. Uh, and, and I just want to um, ask the mayor of Waddet. He, he mentioned a little bit about the kids' hockey. But what kind of effect has it had um, overall on the community? You know, I know it's economic effect, but uh, you know, we've heard stories about the family members separated, and I, I know we're dealing with uh, with one and over a little further uh, uh, west where there's a married couple actually on different sides of the border. But but uh, you know, so economically and effects on the city and things that are going on about that. Thank you very much. Um, before we started that, I just want to reiterate something about the Northwest Bank workers. It's a personal thing that I know about. I've worked as a veteran service officer for Mitchell County. I have for 25 yeah, they're years. Not, they're they're not, not the mic. Uh, 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 can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. I work um, as a veteran service officer for Mitchell County. I've done that for 25 years. It's one of the best jobs I've ever had. I don't consider it a job, I consider it a privilege. Um, but, one of the problems we had is we had a veteran up on the Northwest Ankle that had some issues. He had some felony charges on his record that weren't his, and, and we needed to get him across the border because he needed some mental health um, doctoring and some other things. We could not get him across the border. We couldn't get him through because of that felony charge that turned out not to be his charge. Um, we had to sneak him across. We had to do stuff and things that I'm not going to admit to right here, but. We needed to get him to a scary. It was a, it was a military veteran for the U.S. government. So finally, we got it resolved. But we need to figure that out. There's, with the technology nowadays, there's got to be a way you can put GPS or something on vehicles and track them as they go 
able to do, you know, and spend time on them, whatever you need to do. You know, that's that's American citizens up there. They need to be able to travel freely back and forth to the country. But to our community, I, I think we're suffering two ways. First of all, we're suffering from not getting our friends from Canada that come down and spend money. Um, Rainy River, the community right across from Madet, didn't have just got it's got a small grocery store and a little. I, I don't even know if that's a gas station anymore. Um, they were relying on Madet for all of that stuff, and the businesses of Madet were relying. I inter I talked to call to talk to a lot of places. Um, Twenty to 50 percent, they they were down in sales because of the border. Um, we need to figure out. You know, there's got to be some common sense way. You know, you got families like I said earlier. My my mom can look at her granddaughter across the border. I mean, it's quite a ways, but you can see her. But you can't miss her. She can't. You know, she's 82 or 83 years old. You know, who knows how much longer? You know, we need to. We need to. There's got to be common sense. I mean, some of us have it. You know, we should borrow it from other people and let's spread it around. And you know, let's you know, let's make it better. You know, let's you know, we we need we're, we're both sides, like I said. You know, we we need thank you. Well, thank you very much for those comments, Mayor. And, and I think that I want to thank you to the our constituents, citizens who serve for spending some time with us today. I want you to know that both Congresswoman Fishback and I represent the rural area. Rural Minnesota and rural America shall never take a back seat. War will close over. that. Northwest Angle, International Falls, Grand Beret, Pigeon River Crossing, that matters to us. So are the airports matter to us, it's commerce, it's economy. And so I want to share, you, you talk about hope, I want to share, I believe that we are towards the end of this pandemic. We are gonna get through this together as not only one nation, but we have our nations, our friends in Canada that are experiencing the same things, as Marcus and Dan talked about. We're going to get through this. We're going to learn from it. our supply chain dependencies. We're going to reduce our dependency on four nations, our critical supplies, and hopefully, as you talked about, Joel, hopefully, very soon, we're going to get back to great sense of intimacy. And Mayor Fabian, I'm going to use, and I'm going to give you credit for it, that Northern Minnesota common sense. I think that's really important. And uh, and I want to thank the panelists for spending some time with us. We're going to bring this back. We're going to be engaged, continue, continually be engaged in the interparliamentary group. And to our colleagues, members of parliament, Marcus and Dan, Thank you very, very much for joining us and, and talking to us about uh, the importance you have for opening up, opening the border. We need to open it uh, now in a responsible way. The, the economies in both countries and both communities and all the communities matter. And I think it's uh, important. So from, uh, from my perspective, I wanna say thank you all for spending some time with us. And I'm now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Fishback, for some closing comments. Well, thank you all very much. And what he said, um, because you, you summed it up so well. And I and I appreciate the, the Northern Minnesota common sense too. I hope that all of Minnesota has common sense. And so, um, but I, really more so than anything, I think we heard some, some really compelling things and some great suggestions. And it is a great discussion. Um, about the kinds of things that we can do. Um, and we need to make sure that we deal with this. And we will continue to fight. Congressman Stauber and I will continue to fight. And I know that there are others um, in, in, in Congress that have some of the same situations in their states. And so we will join together with them and um, really work hard to do what we can to get this taken care of. Um, I appreciate the uh, members of parliament that joined us because it is, it is, it, we, ha we have to work with them in order to make this happen. But I will just wrap up by saying thank you because I appreciate all of the panelists being here, all of you being here, um, taking the time to join us and um, and knowing that this is an important issue that we will continue to work on. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And before we close, I want to, uh, having uh, been a police officer for over two decades, uh, see a police officer standing in the back. Sir, thank you to you and your department and your families for your service and to uh, the men and women who served and are serving and will be serving this nation honorably. We live in the greatest country on earth and you get a call home. Thank you very much. Thank you.